Um, so a slight change in format as we uh, switch to um, a panel. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I think really when we talk about real influence, we are going to be talking very much about influence marketing, which is why we've got some experts here with us today. Um, and I'm going to start the session really with just the, the agreed understanding that it has really changed the marketplace of advertising and marketing. I think we can all agree on that. Um, wanted to start by saying it is still, even though it's in its infancy, one of the most hotly debated, both criticised and you know, uh, praised channels and techniques at the moment. Um, I'm really wanting to get your point of view on how you think it has changed the industry um, today. So Lisa, can we start with you? Yeah. So um, for those of you who don't know, Tribe is a self-service influencer marketplace. We're a tech platform. We're not an agency. Um, and we allow brands and everyday creators to you know, find each other and, and creators to celebrate brands through beautiful content. And so we're, we're kind of a pure tech solution. And what we've found with that is you know, when you allow creators to kind of come to the brand and you kind of don't put a limit on who can respond to a brief, you get an amazing level of dem democratization mm -hmm. of advertising, really, um, where instead of, you know, briefing out certain creatives or, you know, making a brief very narrow, we're kind of casting a really wide net on creativity. And what brands are getting back is a really representative version mm -hmm. of their real customers. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, really how their products are you know, being used or styled in a lot of different creative aesthetics that they may have never thought of or never kind of been able to bring to the table and include in their wider advertising. Yeah. It's really interesting. And I think when we've spoken before, you talked about it essentially kickstarting a new creative economy thanks to the tech behind it. Can you talk a little bit more yeah. about that? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So about, we have you know, Instagram, Twitter and Facebook on our platform, 98% of what is demanded by brands is Instagram because you know, it speaks to the, the limbic system, it's aesthetically pleasing, it's inspiring and aspirational content and um, you know, it really is delivering ROI for brands. Mm -hmm. And when you kind of look at Instagram alone, there are you know, a, a billion active users now and you know, Apple's now a billion dollar, a trillion dollar company. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because everyday creators have you know, this in their pockets and it's incredible it's an incredible tool and we all take and share branded content every day even I do I mean mine's crap but um, <laughs> you know I still do it and I, we, we do it naturally and now essentially technology is creating you know just a bit of a fence around that and a way for brands to harness and leverage all of that great word of mouth mm -hmm. marketing um, to kind of turn their most influential customers into their sales department, but we're also finding that there's now opportunity for brands to turn those influential customers, not just into their sales department and their marketing department, but also their creative department, because it's, you know, the quality of the content, the latest iPhone X was marketed entirely on the, on the camera. You know, it wasn't about using it as a phone anymore, it's about the camera, and I'm sure tonight, is it? This afternoon when the new iPhone gets announced, um, we'll see more of those creator tools because that's the perfect storm, you know, having the, the technology for creators and then the platform to share that creativity. That's what's creating what we feel is the next billion dollar marketplace. And when we talk about a, a billion dollar marketplace and a new economy, we've got um, two guys here which are very much part of that. Just wanted to briefly get your point of view on how that's really become an opportunity to become a creator on behalf of brands, but also a profession in its own right. So, Jeanette, can we start with you? Yes. Um, so I run a blog mm -hmm. alongside with two other girls. We are called The Four of Us. And uh, we use Tribe all the time, but also creating content for our own blog um, and creating content for brands as well and we find it really important because we are all models so we just wanted to be creatives as well that's why we got into the the business and mm -hmm. uh, we really enjoy the side of this side of the of the industry where you can be a creative director as well as a model as well as uh, a writer whatever you want to be i uh, can be um, stylist if I want to I create the content for my blog and this way I create a relationship with brands through tri we use Tribe all the time mm -hmm. as well um, and I think for brands as well it's really important that they get 
authentic content from normal people as well, mm -hmm. not only from their big campaign shots. Yeah. So it's just a wider option for them as well to use. And, and do you find the same, that kind of blend of creativity not being one thing anymore? Is that very much at the forefront of, of what you do? Yeah, well, um, following the last talk, I probably don't want to say I'm an entrepreneur, so... <laughs> <laughs> um, I've had my failures and my successes, so yeah. Um, I kind of fell into this about four months ago, and yeah, it's just... I don't think you would be able to, as an individual, see yourself you know, working with brands like um, Ultimate Ears, a big speaker company, and M&Ms. Mm -hmm. um, and things like that. So you get obviously free sweets, which is great. But um, being able to work with those brands, I think, is is the, yeah, the sort of the, the best bit about it is the yeah. yeah, you know, the little people, if you like, being able to actually be on the front of it. Yeah, the access, exactly. Yeah. So um, which are probably just open to you know, or seen as big celebrities or sort of TV endorsements yeah. and that kind of stuff. Mm. So. And what would you say the benefits are for? for brands and organisations to work with, as you say, the real people rather than some of those those bigger names, mm. what would you say the benefit is? Yeah, well, as you touched upon, really, it's the um, authenticity of it. So being able to speak to consumers through consumers. So mm -hmm. instead of um, whatever it might be, a big you know, celebrity endorsement, half the time you don't actually believe you know, that they do use that product kind of thing. Yeah. So I think yeah. speaking from or selling it through consumers just makes sense on that level, really. And I think that throws up um, the next topic of conversation we wanted to touch upon, which is as a marketplace, as an economy, influencer marketing has been heavily criticised for its lack of authenticity. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to hear both of you say that you, you feel you represent authenticity <coughs> um, in that channel. Um, from my perspective, I think it's because it's a very young channel and a very young industry that it's still in its infancy, so it's, mm. it's feeling its way through some of those ethical challenges. Um, maybe Lisa, what's your perspective on some of the ethical challenges mm. facing such a burgeoning industry? Yeah, this is something um, that we thought about. So Tribe's about three, well, almost three years old, mm. and we were founded by um, a TV and radio presenter in Australia called Jules Lund. Um, any Australians in the room may know him from Dancing with the Stars and stuff like that. Um, but he, he was kind of that, you know, a, a macro influencer. And he, he originally created our platform as a briefing solution because there were too many people involved between a brand and an influencer. And it was, it was taking so much time. So he just thought, if I can just, you know, improve how much time it's between a brand manager and influencer to get a post live, then that's great. And I'll invite all my footballer mates and reality stars into the app and I'll make a buck. Um, and then he very quickly realized that, um, Footballers and reality stars are not great content creators. Um, they're they're famous in their own right, and you know they're famous for something or known for something. Mm -hmm. And really, you know, between them and a brand, what people are engaging with is them. But when you kind of flip the model, and once technology did it, you know, improve that ability for a brand to work with a creator, in the same time, you know, that it took you to work with one macro influencer, all of a sudden a brand could work with a hundred in the same mm -hmm. amount of time. Mm -hmm. And what that allowed was for them to work with people that, like I said, you know, like Janet, like Freddie, that, um, you know, bring all different, you know, I guess shades of their consumer base to life for all different types of brand and every conceivable niche out there um, with an amazing creativity. And for us, we really needed to embed authenticity into the model because the first thing was flipping the model and working with micro talent. Mm -hmm. We've always said that if you're not willing to go out and buy the product, you've got no right to recommend anyone else does. Yep. So unless a product isn't actually available in stores, we need to work with a brand for something that's like about to launch. Mm -hmm. We typically don't do any sampling through the platform. Mm -hmm. um, so it has to be everyday consumers. That's one level of authenticity. The second one we put in place was that creators have to create the finished content up front and put mm -hmm. their own price on it and present that to a brand, like a pitch. Mm -hmm. And we say it's kind of like inviting 100 wedding photographers to a wedding and then just picking the photos you like. So instead of commissioning the work up front, the creativity mm -hmm. kind of comes to you. And that's that second level of authenticity to know that the creators are happy to do that work and put that effort in. You know, and you get to set your own reward. Yep. Um, and it is that free and open marketplace. It does mean that you win some, you lose some. Mm -hmm. But there's that next level of going, this person's gonna do the work instead of saying, I don't get out of bed for less than five grand. Yeah. Um, and so all of those things, you know, coupled with what technology is now providing us with sort of anti-fraud measures, all of that embeds a lot of integrity and authenticity into the model. And I think that um, 
like you said, it's a very, very early stage channel and more of this will come to the forefront, but things like disclosing it's an ad, all yeah. of that brand safety, you know, that for us is, is paramount and, you know, we should set a really, really high benchmark for, for that with brands and creators because at the end of the day, there's 25 or 30 million accounts out there on Instagram mm -hmm. alone that could be classified as micro-influencers. Mm -hmm. So brands don't need to be working with people that say, actually, I think you need to send the Moet to me. I'm not going to go and buy it. <laughs> Um, because we can kind of get rid of that ego and really elevate the creators that are willing to kind of do the work and are real customers and, and real advocates for brands. So yeah. then do you think those macro influencers are generally inauthentic because of those behaviours? I think, um, you know, because brands kind of had one avenue to go to them, they, they didn't have enough real estate to actually post on. You can't do a sponsored post every day because your audience mm -hmm. will switch off. So the price went up. Um, and so I think that now that's kind of trickling back down, I think there can be a level of authenticity across all levels of audience. Mm -hmm. I actually don't think that will matter. Um, and brands will, will see and, and test different levels of ROI depending on mm -hmm. the kinds of creators they work with. At the moment, it's more efficient to work with a larger pool of micro-influencers because the scales have tipped too mm -hmm. high, you know, sort of the price has gone a bit too crazy with a lot of macro creators that yeah. kind of had a monopoly on the demand from brands. Yeah. But now that that's shifting, I think we'll start to see prices settle a bit. And people will only work with brands that they want to work with. They'll probably work with them on a maybe a longer term basis. The macro influencers will get into more exclusivity agreements mm -hmm. and have, I guess, more ambassadorial relationships, I think. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how that, that levels out over time. And I think that audiences aren't really growing. I think most creators I speak to can attest to that, that mm -hmm. they're kind of stagnated across most platforms. And so with that means you've got to, you know, you've really got to nurture your community, make sure they're engaged and really value them. And I don't know any creator that is willing to go out and be inauthentic for yeah. a quick buck <laughs> because at the sacrifice of that. Yeah, the price is too high if exactly. you get that wrong. Um, and I think given the price is so high when people do get that wrong and you see it in industry press all the time, I think <coughs> Listerine's the, the latest example that's been doing the rounds. Um, as creators yourselves, have you come up against ethical you know, decisions that have challenged you or do you hold yourself to a particular set of ethics that you could share with us today? I personally hold myself and we agreed with the girls that I'm doing the blog with that we will only work with brands that we believe in, mm -hmm. that we like, because, as you said, the, the risk is too high. I can't afford to, to lie and say, I love this product. Maybe I haven't even used it yet. Mm. And I, I know a lot of people do that, and I don't understand how or why. Mm -hmm. Because, as you said, if they find out that you, you're not genu genuinely behind this, this product, that is, that, that's it for you. Mm. Who will believe you after that? And, it, and so all the brands that um, we advertise for, we pick, and uh, we try, or even if they come to us as a collaboration, we've said no to brands before, mm -hmm. and we just always believe that we'll say yes to the right ones. Mm -hmm. And even though it's, as you said, it can be tempting, mm. but we just, we just always believe to, to work with brands that, that we like to use in our everyday life. And that you would be willing to buy as Lisa Of course. Said. What about you? Yeah, um, well, yeah, so f I've, I've been in it from both angles in the sense of having to pay people for influence for my mm -hmm. companies, and then at the same time now, more recently, seeing it from the other side. And <clears throat> we always had the thing of we didn't really want to pay for the influence because you're just paying for someone to say, yes, I like this product, whether they do or not. Mm. Um, but now, from my angle, the best scenario I can kind of give really is I recently got approached by a company that. Um, uh, dye your hair when it's grey. I don't know if you can see, I'm 28, I don't really have that many grey hairs. Um, and their response was when I said, I don't really use the products, obviously, like, thanks, thanks, but no thanks, they said, I didn't have to use it. So I was then a bit like, well, yeah, this definitely isn't Food Tribe. Um, and then obviously, yeah, so you definitely get that conflict. It's like, right, well, essentially, you just want to pay me to say to my, you know, the followers, hey, yeah, use whatever that product might be. So yeah, so f because I've been from the other end, I wouldn't want that. And I think it shines through. I think unless you are authentic, unless you are actually, you know, M&M's is a good one. I love M&M's, so that wasn't too hard <laughs> to say yes to. Um, but yeah, unless you, do say, unless you do actually love the product, I think it will show through. And I think over the long term, that will kind of 
you'll definitely see a negative effect from our end as well as yeah. sort of yours. So, something we're really passionate about as well is if we give creators enough branded opportunities every week, um, you know, we're uploading sort of 30 or 40 briefs a week into mm -hmm. the app. Like, you don't need to feel compelled, you know, to get, you know, money for something that you don't actually believe in as well. Mm -hmm. So we think that as long as you're kind of overwhelming people with, with choice and opportunity as well, no one needs to make those trade-offs. Um, so the last question uh, for the group is really, technology has kind of unlocked and enabled creativity and, and individuals to really blend with brands. Um, do you see any innovations coming down the line or any change to technology that you would like to see to enable more of that? Hmm. Well, there is always change coming, mm -hmm. always. So what we have right now, I'm quite enjoying at the moment, what Tribe can provide to us, what, what I have technology through Instagram or mm -hmm. the blog or stories, IGT, whatever that is. I think that's it's so overwhelming mm -hmm. and it's so much to catch up on all the Enough time. Right now, right now <laughs> can we just, yes, calm down a little bit? Because, <laughs> <Let's enjoy it. laughs> you know, there's always something new that now, because the biggest thing was YouTube, now we have IGTV, mm. and now, well, now I hear that, oh, maybe it's not even YouTube where I have to go, I have to go to IG. So, yeah, I think it is going to improve and, and new things are coming along every day, but I don't mind if it calms maybe down a little bit. Maybe streamlining of technology will be mm. next. Mm. Any last thoughts from either of you? Yeah, I, I think that um, technology is going to help a lot with regulation mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the, I guess, maturity of this channel generally. Yeah. I think that technology can go too far in terms of matching creators and brands and different kind of AI tech mm. and there can be too much sometimes. Too um, hyper-targeted. Yeah, you know, it can be. And so for us, you know, What's really exciting with technology is, is the next phase of how it can help brands use creator content in their advertising as well at scale. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, when everyday creators, you know, you kind of have a ceiling, you know, Fitness Freddy, probably not going to, I don't know, do too much junk food or, you know, no, things a, designed, you know, for women. I do, I do quite a lot of junk food. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about balance, maybe. But, um, you know, we, we definitely have the PTs that won't do alcohol. We have... Yeah. M yeah. mothers that won't do, you know, weapons, I don't know. Um, but, you know, there, there is a ceiling to what people's kind of niche can give them. And so, you know, for us, it's about how can we get more branded opportunities that go and kind of transcend social media as well, mm -hmm. where, you know, you guys are becoming full-time creators. There's not a room I go into with creators where I don't ask, would you like to do this full-time? And more than 70% of the room kind of right. puts their hand up. You know, for us, it's about how can we fill the void for marketers where they're struggling to fulfill the volume of and variety of content that needs to be kind of mm -hmm. fulfilled with digital advertising. We feel that, you know, your customers are that solution out there and that technology plays a role with that as well, where actually the question of influence actually can move to the side for yeah. a second and it's you guys can fund what you are really passionate about yeah. from an editorial perspective where this conversation around authenticity and integrity can also then simmer down because, mm -hmm. you know, people can make a living by being able to create amazing branded content. Great. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.